Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the fifth installment in our Language and Identity Workshop Series. My name is Hannah dahlberg Dodd, Project Assistant Professor at Tokyo College, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to direct your attention to the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen. If you prefer to listen to today's lecture in Japanese, please feel free to select the Japanese button for live English to Japanese interpretation. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Otomo Ruriko, who will be discussing language and healthcare work, focusing on trade, migration, and policy discourse. Dr. Otomo is an associate professor in the research faculty of media and communication at Hokkaido University. She is a sociolinguist whose work has focused on language policy and planning in a Japanese context, but her research also extends to issues that concern the impacts of social transformations on language ideology and practice. Some of her recent contributions have appeared in Multilingua and Asian Studies Review, and she is currently completing a book for Springer about Japan's language policy with regards to free trade policy and the transnational migration of healthcare workers. For today's event, we will begin with the lecture by Dr. Otomo, after which open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, one quick note for the audience, please use the Q&A functions provided in the Zoom window uh, to send us your questions, and you can put them in at any point. All right, Dr. Otomo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Hanna, for such a warm introduction. So uh, let me first uh, share my um, presentation slide. Okay, on uh, the first screen. I hope, I think it's working fine. So uh, my name is, again, my name is Otomo Riko, uh, Riko Otomo from Hokkaido University. So thank you very much for you know coming to my talk today and and I'm very sorry for you know um, making everybody wake up quite early in the morning um, basically because uh, my family adopt um, their day uh, daylight saving within the family so uh, that's how it, it's that's my life has been you know organized in in such a way and today's I'm talking about um, my research project which was uh, the which was beginning in 2013 as my uh, PhD project, and uh, the the focus of today talk today's talk is um, also uh, the the main themes of the the forthcoming book. Okay, so this is the outline for uh, today's talk. So for those of you who may not be familiar well with the, the area of language policy and planning, I'm going to provide some overview and I gradually move my uh, talk uh, into the economic uh, partnership agreement as an object of research project and the discussion and, and conclusion. So let's then begin with the field overview. So uh, the, 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 the discipline language policy and, uh, and planning, LPP, has uh, a relatively short uh, or young um, history or young in its age. So activity in 1950s and 1960s, LPP activity, LPP research, were pretty much carried out by a uh, limited number of people such as government officials and linguists. So they focused on reforming language systems and language functions uh, because they have set the goal um, of their, their research and activity as a modernization of nation states and also um, uh, solving language issues of the newly independent nation. So that's the first wave. And the second wave came as a more like a counter model to the first wave. In this um, area or in this wave, maybe um, the research is, I think research can be largely framed as critical language policy. Uh, in, in that language policy is seen as something linked with power and social, political and economic interest. And research also pay attention to language policy, because, language sorry, language ideology, because uh, it was considered as central to the way the language policy is created and implemented and revised or subverted. So the second wave is still influential nowadays, but we are at lo located at the third, somewhere at the third wave, a third wave we can say. So one of the reasons why the, the, the second wave was 
was kind of losing impact is because it faces some uh, critics criticism, criticism uh, such as the researcher agree, uh, such, such as uh, research pointed out that the the critical language policy cannot accommodate or cater to the linguistics and literacy needs of the small communities or local setting. So um, in, in under such a condition or critical um, um, arguments, uh, the third, third way researchers try to uh, advocate for complex and idiosyncratic nature of language policy. And one of the such attempts was done by recent on Holmberger's theorization, LPP onion, so, which is pr pretty much a metaphor, uh, you know, onion metaphor. So to consider a language policy activity as like an onion. So the researcher's role is to peel one skin from one to another. And they also uh, see the importance of, of agency. Methodologically speaking, um, the researchers in the third wave uh, are likely to, or uh, are pretty much encouraged to take the ethnographic perspective to do their research because it was thought important to examine how a language policy is created, interpreted, and appropriated in a local setting or in a particular uh, setting. Okay, the notion of language policing uh, put forth by Blomert and others is also characteristics of the third wave uh, because it focuses on the process rather than the form of producing the rules and regulation. So this enable us to see, this concept enables us to see the involvement of a variety of actors. So in Japan and elsewhere, the, um, the nation state has been identified as the policy actor or the initiator of major language uh, planning projects, often calling in experts, linguists, or established language academy to solve national language problem, which are related to national building or economic development and so forth. Instead, the contemporary LPP researchers have questioned the role of the nation states. So in fact, they have shown the emergence of equally or equally powerful or more powerful institutions such as supranational organization, local municipalities and corporations, NGOs and families and institutions, uh, which determine the LPP decisions and attempts to control people's linguistic behaviors in, in language varieties. On a different note, uh, other researchers also argue that the nation state's uh, mode of governance has been changing, um, not just weakening. So in that the, um, for, uh, we have to, the re LPP researchers are promoted, uh, are required to look into the changing roles of the nation state in the act of language policy. So other emerging trend uh, found in the third wave of LPP research is to examine other forms of policy in which language and human communication, social cultural issues get represented. And I'm not gonna read the, uh, the line by line here in this, in this slide, but my uh, work, uh, my focus on trade policy is easily situated within this uh, expanded scope. So um, reflecting the trend in the field, my research project focuses on a bilateral free trade policy, which was not the subject of traditional language policy investigation. However, as shown later, uh, a free trade policy gives a glimpse of language uh, education policy uh, in which language testing, language learnings are surfaced in a multiple layers of official declarations and documents and also operational practices, but packaged rather differently, uh, differently from other ordinary language education policies. Also, the free trade policy in question, uh, which I'm going to, um, to explain in the next slide, uh, also demonstrates the complexity of agency uh, because it is characterized by the involvement of signatory countries and multiple ministries, sector organization, participating institutions, and individuals. And of course, they have different interests and obligations. Okay. 
Uh, the Economic Partnership Agreement is EPA is the focus of my talk and also the object of, of my analysis for my PhD project and, and for the forthcoming book. So this is an economic oriented agreement and uh, which is intended to accelerate trade investment between the second signed countries and tighten economic relationship in a broader range of economic activities. Normally, uh, or most of the of cases, uh, the elimination or easing of regulation regarding trade investments, such as tariff reduction, is involved. And for just the illustration purposes, uh, I have um, listed the, 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 the countries that, that Japan has signed the EPA with. So mostly many, most of the EPA includes a clause which resembles an immigration scheme, which is called the movement of natural persons. And, and they are normally include the investors and short-term business travelers. However, the Japan's EPAs with uh, the three Southeast East, East Asian countries encourages and regulates the movement of foreign healthcare worker under this clause. And please let me allow to refer to this specific clause as the EPA program and from now on. So EPA program is quite notable, firstly, because it was the first time for Japan to actualize the sector specific immigration. And secondly, this, the EPA signed between Japan and three country is a pioneering trade policy that operates human migration in full play so at present, uh, WTO, uh, World Trade Organization, sets the General Agreement on Trade and Service, uh, GATS, GATS, Model 4, which is designed to facilitate uh, individuals cross-border travel from their country, from their own country, to uh, provide professional services in other countries. However, many countries do not use this GATS Mode 4, but often resort to uh, more uh, to more manageable arrangements such as uh, bilateral labor agreements or other migration schemes because uh, that's mode four is not a readily available immigration package in its own right. So of course the EPA is not equal to GATS mode four, but the EPA is significant in that it represents one of the few examples in the world that integrates labor migration in the format of a trade policy. Okay, so then this is the uh, sort of visualization of the mechanism of the Japan Philippine EPA program. And I have to mention that EPA program has two courses, two professional courses, one for caregiving profession, here I am I'm presenting, and the other is for a nurse profession. So um, if you're a prospective Filipino caregiving candidate, you must have a university degree and also a caregiver license, license back in the Philippines. And you prepare our set of documents and, and, and submit the application documents to the POEA, Philippine Overseas Employment Administration. Uh, on the Japan side, the uh, prospective Japanese institution uh, mostly the elder care institutions or healthcare institutions such as hospitals uh, also prepare the set of documents and send those application forms to Japan International Corporation of Welfare Services, CHICWALS. Um, and then they uh, do the mechanical matching between employers, employees, and successfully matched uh, Filipino um, employees, or they are called uh, caregiving candidates for the respective professions, uh, go through one year Japanese language training. And after the training, they begin working in, in, in their uh, host institutions, while they were receiving the on-the-job training and studying for the national licensure examination because they were required to sit this examination after four years. So if they pass the exam, uh, they can uh, be, uh, they can continue to work as certified caregivers as long as they wish. However, if they fail the exam, they have to return uh, home. So that's the very um, simplistic uh, mechanism. 
So in the praise beer slide, uh, you can see that the language education is built into the EPA program, so which is unlike other free trade agreements such as NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, signed between the US and Canada, Canada and Mexico, which uh, legally allows Mexican nurses to migrate for work, but offers no language education support. And of course, EPA candidates are required to take the licensure examination in the medium, medium of the uh, Japanese language. And finally, the EPA candidates are employed in the healthcare sector, uh, where barbaro communication is often considered a vital and high stakes attribute. So it was not only me who saw the uh, many language issues and language component uh, in the EPA program. So other researchers have also addressed language issues inherent to in, in the EPA program. I And I briefly summarized here. I'm not going to read this slide line by line because the uh, you can you know there's a tons of research done already and because the purpose of this slide is not to show the the gist of the existing research but to give you an impression or sense that the EPA program are concerns a wide range of language policy issues such as language education language choice and language usage and that it takes on the characteristics of a formally structured language education policy. So to me, the EPA prog program is certainly and certainly and surely a form of language policy, but this kind of framing is not popular among the mainstream research area. And, and the next slide is the summary of the sort of mainstream, mainstream uh, research area. So although each uh, research area, Japanese language education, healthcare, and policy studies is quite informative and I learned a lot and gained lots of insights from them, I have not followed their path, but instead see the peer program as a language, language policy. Uh, one of the reasons is that I was well informed by the input from the contemporary language study uh, literature, and I'm going to show you in this slide. So in my, many migration study, the acquisition of language in a whole society is believed to maximize migrants' um, social economic capitals. However, researchers, especially in the field of social linguistics, have casted a critical gaze into the frequently alleged reward for uh, learning a dominant or privileged language in whole society's labor market. So, for example, um, uh, these researchers identify that the many workplaces, such as cleaning and factory work, do not require or even limit their uh, migrant workers' language acquisition. So, in other words, these sort of cutting re cutting edge research argue that there must be other forms of inequality in effect, and they question how the mechanism under which we naturally believe that the language education is something good or something beneficial or even necessary for migrants is made and sustained. So uh, these studies have provided me with a germ of reflection and ideas which enable me to depart from the following the mainstream research trends and to carve out a new approach to address and examine language issues of the EPA program uh, more fully. So the second um, reason why I did not follow the mainstream approach uh, is that I was really critical, oh sorry, I was critical of the treatment of language in some of the existing literature. And for example, the language issues are set in stone and they're not seen as a potential arena for change and transformation. And at the time when I began my PhD research, only a few research, researchers have addressed in situ language use in the workplace. So I was also uh, wondering, um, why, uh, how the local setting has been operating in terms of language policy. Is it really monolingual language policy or multilingual language policy? And also I was um, also curious um, how, uh, why I saw the, 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 the EP program per se looks like 
uh, monolingual language policy. So that sort of makes me uh, sort of might makes me think that you know I should do a more thorough a thorough analysis on the policy text. So uh, in order to address these points, my research research project had two aspects. First, I uh, examined how language policy is implemented and negotiated in a local setting. So if you're interested in, in this, this aspect, um, I have written in my previous uh, uh, publication, so um, you, you may refer to this. And uh, the second aspect, well, it's, which is the focus of today's talk and also the forthcoming book, is the policy discourse. So although the, the policy discourse impacts and directs and informs people's viewpoints and action, uh, there has been little attempts to examine and study policy text and policy discourse in detail, especially within the EPA program research. Um, so of course I acknowledge with caution that discursive approach is never perfect and has limitations as I introduced earlier, I believe it helps to identify the condition which allows a particular language issue to be silenced or counted as uh, worth a tackling problem. Okay, so uh, the main value of policy-oriented analysis is a uh, well understood amongst the LPP researchers especially the critical language policy. Uh, one of the reason is that because it can show, so it can highlight the interaction between policy texts, discursive practices, and wider social political context. So this interaction resonates well with the concept of third wave LPP, which sees uh, LPP as a dynamic um, multi-layered processes. So what this implies for the policy text analyst analysis is that the intention of the written documents, be it policy text or official declaration or sort of curriculum or whatever, cannot be guaranteed. And the uh, policy analysts must re repeat reading those texts and placing policy text in a wider social, political and economic context. So when analyzing a broad range of texts regarding the EPA program, I basically adapted conceptual models offered by Ball. So um, in contrast to simplistic assumption that a given policy is a direct representation of authorial intention, policy as text approach sort of refers to a complex realities of policy interpretations and implementation. So in this view, every policy text has many possible readings and divergent meaning because the readers have differences, uh, different. Therefore, uh, contradiction and negotiation naturally occur, leading to varieties in implementation. On the other hand, the research on policy as discourse uh, investigate investigates how policy is uh, charged with issues of power that can limit the range of policy interpretations and implementation. So indeed, a policy as discourse allows researchers to shake the foundational body of a given policy uh, by questioning uh, or making questions such as uh, who gets positioned in having a say about policy decision and how and why they obtain such positions and, and so on. So in the field of LPP, the similar conceptual models were developed, uh, for example, by Homburgers and implementational and ideological spaces are rather conceived, uh, conceived rather in a positive sense. And in my understanding, these uh, spaces are uh, referred to the capability or feasibility of a given language policy to accommodate multiple languages, literacies and identities, or the capabilities or feasibility of language educators or and language users to embark on multilingual education. And, um, with these conceptual pointers in mind, I examined language policy activities materialized in the various forms of written 
uh, nonverbal verbal communication about the EPA programs. Um, in other words, I analyzed several policy papers, press releases, JIC laws, uh, reports, and actors' uh, verbal remarks in official meetings, as I consider them important discussive practices uh, which form and inform the EPA program as a language policy. So in the interest of time, I deliberately cut detailed methodological and analytical section and moved on to uh, select finding part uh, from the next slide and on. So the, the rest of the presentation focuses on one piece of analysis uh, that is critical to draw the conclusion of the research project and which is the examination of advisory panel. So I'm going. I'm not going to explain um, each panel uh, was assigned to do what each panel was assigned to do, uh, and they did. But this figure represents an overview of the exam 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 advisory panel. So uh, they were formed against the backdrop of the low exam pass rate among EPA candidates. Uh, to discuss lang and and so that's why they wanted they they formed our, a group to discuss language expressions in a licensure examination as well as the medium of language in examination however this oh sorry i i haven't shown the 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 uh, the figure sorry so uh then this figure also shows that uh quite uh in a simple manner that the controversial progressive agenda shown at the bottom, uh, sorry, at the top, have ended up being reshaped in, in conservative reform plans at the bottom. So because it is really complicated to discuss the process that run through the through each panels within the given time slot I have and the inter interrelated connection uh, between the agendas and reform plans, I focus one of the most disputed uh, agendas uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a red box, which is to discuss whether the existing nursing caregiving examination can be uh, conducted in a different form. So to be specific, our nursing exam panel two and a caregiving exam panel were assigned to discuss the possible use of the translated licensure examination in English and Indonesian along with the Japanese communication skills test. So compare with the on-the-job training that can, can, uh, candidates uh, receive, at their host institution and also the pre-employment Japanese language training where the standard Japanese language dominate. These panels were quite innovative in considering the potential roles of other language in an EPA program. So in Hornberger's terms, so this uh, panels represents the ideological and implementational spaces in which ideological transformation may be possible in enabling uh, alternative forms of language policy to emerge or to be planned and perhaps uh, to be implemented fully. However, in the end, such space was closed and the monolingual operation of the national uh, licensure examination has been continuing up to now. However, the analyzing how it was done so is quite impressive and inform in, uh, in, uh, interesting. So before moving to explain how the meetings discursively rejected the use of uh, translated examinations, it is important to note the structural issues because they play a significant part as well. So first of all, the panel ad pan ad pan advisory panels involved a very large number of members and invited speakers. And the, the member selection was pretty much conspicuous. Our uh, first uh, Filipino affiliated groups were absent and the expertise of some members was uh, of little relevance to the panel agenda, such as economics or labor issues. And these discussants attended the meeting only a few times. And uh, furthermore, the members with the background in the, health, the field of healthcare constituted the majority of boys. And secondly, the, the scheduling was quite tight and panels were generally given insufficient time to run the discussion. So each meeting only lasted two to 
five hours and only four to six sessions of the panel in, uh, in total. And the interval between one meeting uh, and, to, and the next was seven to 10 days um, in many cases. So the tight scheduling inevitably limited the breadth and depth of the discussion. So this time pressured uh, schedule uh, tri trivialized the important external output, uh, input, sorry. Uh, for example, public comments were poorly, um, poorly solicited and invited speaker were required to leave the room right after they have finished uh, their sharing. So they didn't get any chance to participate in the discussion that followed. Okay, so let them um, then let me explain how the meetings discursively rejected the meeting agenda, that is to discuss the combined views of translated examination and the Japanese communication skills test. So identify the, identify the notion of unchangeable exam is one of the condition that shuts the door for the progress exam, uh, exam reform and uh, underlies the maintenance of the status quo. So uh, let me illustrate how this notion was perpetuated in a meeting. So in order to make uh, this notion as something believable, uh, one uh, possible method is to discard either the translated national examination or the Japanese communication skills test. So this case one deals with the latter. So in the panels, uh, at least uh, panel discussions and invited speakers mention at least five different tests, which could be served as a candidate test for the Japanese communication skills test in the exam reform, or at least merited attention as they may inform the creation of a fair, uh, socially just exam for foreign healthcare workers. However, uh, these tests went unnoticed and slipped from the mainstream discussion. And uh, of course, the final uh, report didn't mention anything about these tests. So firstly, uh, this is firstly because the panel's meeting schedule. As I said, uh, one of the invited speaker who introduced many tests, many different tests, um, had to leave the room immediately after uh, they have finished their sharing. So they could not keep talking about these different tests and how they might be, in, uh, be um, helpful for the exam reform to be, to be shaped. And the second reason is the stance and position of the, uh, the discussions of speakers who introduced these tests. So the one, one person was not supportive of the exam reform at all. And the another person was EPA candidate who were who was invited to the to the panel to provide their thoughts, but uh, in general the EPA candidates uh, took a role profiles and were probably uh, poorly recognized as the legitimate policy actors in the wider policy discourse. So my interpretation for this case one is that uh, no elaboration about these existing tests. So it brings one step closer to the rejection of progress, progressive uh, uh, reform agenda. And it's, it somehow did the, the uh, ground uh, work for the construction of the notion that the exam reform is a taboo. Okay, so this is the uh, second case. So the notion of the exam reform as a taboo is further uh, achieved by discarding, uh, discarding the other uh, option and that is the translated uh, national license examination. So firstly, it was achieved by involving no translators or no specialist in the in uh, no specialist in translation in the panel member. So which is crazy, but with, that's how they were done. In addition, the panel didn't invite uh, those professionals to any session to any meeting sessions. So the secondly, the distorted meaning of the global standard was employed to appeal the unfeasibility of the translation. So in the third meeting of uh, this nursing exam panel two, a Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare provided information about the certification scheme for foreign born uh, nurses in seven countries 
and I named the, the country now, so the United States, Canada, Germany, South Korea, China, England, and Sweden. And the Ministry of Health and Labor and Welfare showed that the no country administered the examination in language other than that of the said countries. So on the basis of this global standard, and this is a powerful evidence, of course, the panel almost unanimously agree not to translate examination. However, of course, the selection of these seven countries is questionable. Ministry of Health and Labor and Welfare didn't provide no, uh, rationale for the inclusion of, of these countries and exclusion of other countries, such as Australia and New Zealand, where an English proficiency test designed for healthcare professionals is uh, utilized as part of the assessment for foreign-born applicants. So my interpretation for this case too is that the myth of the translatability was based on logically fragile grounds. However, the panel successfully closed the implementation and ideological spaces for multilingual setting, uh, multilingual sorry, testing. So uh, in order to finalize the construction that the exam reform is certainly a taboo, it is also, um, um, necessary to criticize the very idea of the exam, re exam reform. So therefore, the anti-reformers are made of concerted efforts at equating any exam reform with the lowered exam standard. So the anti-reformers uh, claim that any exam reform is hazardous to Japan's uh, high level of medicine and healthcare because the national licensure examination are a primary means to protect Japan's reputation as a leader in Asia and assures the medical and nursing care standards. So I have quoted uh, one comment from one of the, uh, the, the members of the panels here. Um, these remarks uh, were produced mainly by anti-reformers and anti-reformers are uh, basically the 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 are coming from the healthcare background, and they are the majority of the panel discussants. And the second factor of sort of, sort of constructing the the notion that the exam reform is actually the lowered uh, exam standard is that the healthcare interest groups are the general not supportive for the EPA program uh, per se, and but at the same time they are pretty much powerful policy actors. So my interpretation for this case three is that um, the, the powerful healthcare sectors succeeded in crafting and circulating a worst case scenario. Uh, that is the exam reform causes miscommunication among practitioners and with patients, and they would uh, they lead to the medical accidents and collapse of the medical uh, healthcare systems and certification system, and which uh, will have an adverse effect on Japan's reputation. And at the same time, the healthcare sector succeeded in choking off the alternative uh, discourse or scenario, and uh, because they see the reform as something um, purely negative and transgressive, and they do not see the potential of reforms such as in, in, inventing a renewed and well-suited um, examination system for all test takers. So I think almost the end of the presentation. So, so here's the summary of the finding. So when supporting or opposing the exam reforms, policy actors had to attend to a suitable set of rationales to back their arguments and make them appeal logical, plausible, and agreeable. And in my presentation, I have shown that the notion of, of unchangeable or unshakable examination was one of such a notion and also demonstrated this notion was heavily promoted to, to discourage the combined use of the translation, a translated nas national licensure examination and a communication skills test. So by framing this, the examination reform as a taboo, the panel succeeded in painting problems of the low exam pass rates amongst the EPA candidates as purely individuals matters and, and also in circulating the discourse that the EPA candidates are the ones at fault, not the examination. 
And this is the policy discourse that made the scapegoat political uh, scapegoating possible. So from the beginning, the course of the panel discussion and final decision were look like in the hands of language policy arbiters, that is the powerful healthcare sectors, including the panel organizer, Ministry of Health and uh, Labor and Welfare, which had taken a conservative positions and cautious stance on the peer program per se. Okay, so thus far, um, there has been no sign of another opening of ideological implementational space in which new like some reforms were reclaimed or relevant discussion resumed. So there are a number of reasons. So first of all, uh, language uh, expression problems uh, are continuously identified, but some of them are remain untreated. And the government governments didn't make any gestures to examine other potential causes for the lower exam pass rate. And that means although um, um, a lot of researchers identify other potential causes, but there was no, um, that, that means the government did not reflect any research evidence into the policy making. However, the governments are really, um, um, I don't know how to say, uh, uh, governments are really uh, uh, encouraging themselves to take measures to place EPA candidates as subjective and agented position, such as they introduce a uh, prior linguistic screening and language learning support was pretty much enhanced compared with the very beginning of the EPA program. And lastly, the powerful policy actors such as GQOS uh, did not seem to value the exam reforms or appreciate the impact of exam reform. So from these uh, sort of evidence, and I, I can say that the exam reforms, at least on the level of the uh, policy discourse is, is maybe already a thing of the past. So this is the last slide um, and conclusion. So partly following Gottschalk's uh, prediction about Jap Japan's language policy, I argue uh, that multiple languages will be continuously marginalized in a policy discourse of the EPA program. Uh, this is not only because we have observed no opening for implementational or ideological, ideological space. Um, although I cannot fully explain in today's presentation, the book, the forthcoming book, uh, shows Japan's national pride uh, plays a crucial role in the policy discourse. In fact, an alternative um, policy discourse, uh, such as Japan is lagging behind uh, in the world, uh, worldwide competition in recruiting uh, foreign healthcare workers, was found in the sets of text I analyzed. However, it seems to be nowhere near uh, enough to, cha to challenge Japan's national identity as a monolingual nation with the excellent medicine and care work. So, um, my conjecture is that the largely monolingual exam uh, regime is expected to continue at least for some years ahead. So, of course, this bleak feature scenario does not negate the possibility of multilingualism in the local workplace. In fact, like my work and, and reported elsewhere, the EPA program is implemented in a highly multilingual setting, and they have shown that multilingual or uh, multi -languages, multiple languages play a role in the Japan's healthcare work. However, at the level of uh, policy discourse, uh, to me, expedient multilingualism persists in the least disruptive formats in the EPA program. So one such example or one good example is the partial use of English in a national examination, which was readily accepted due to the uh, presumed educational benefit for the Japanese lang language, uh, Japanese test takers. So uh, to conclude or to leave my last word for this presentation, the EPA program uh, does not address or challenge the conventional structure or or inequality or power balance uh, but reinforces or necessitates or even makes use of those um, um, old ideology. Uh, of course, they are also struggling to legitimize these uh, conventional structures and, and also material operation. So that's the end of my presentation. And here's are the references. 
uh, and and that's that's that came to the uh, that's brought me to the last slide. And thank you uh, for your kind attentions and your comments and question are very much welcome. And I have to mention that I'm really slow on uptake. So if you raise a really provo provocative question, uh, I'd rather happy to receive your comments and question um, via an email, uh, then I can take more time to, to respond to your uh, you know, uh, questions or more fully. And I also thank you, uh, thank uh, the organizers for today's uh, presentation and their efforts and energy putting in to uh, make this event happen. So that's the end of my presentation. And okay, so can I close the video? Thank you so much, Dr. Otomo, for that insight into you know, the influence that discourse around language policy has had on migration issues in the healthcare industry. Um, next, let's open the floor to questions from the audience. As a reminder, you can put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. See, while we wait for questions from the audience, I actually have one, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so your example of uh, catastrophizing was very interesting. Um, I, I admit, I actually kind of laughed a little out loud just because it's like, ah, of course, there's you can really see that like essentialized relationship between like language and culture, even in discourses around like, like um, language policy and like the medical sector, right? Just the idea that like exam reform would erode Japan's medical culture and identities. Mm -hmm. Just such a such an incredible overstatement. <laughs> and I was wondering if you had any other um, kind of instances of catastrophizing you've seen in the discourse or if you've seen kind of like an uptick at any point or, or like maybe like it peaked at some point and then kind of fell off or like, you know, like any sort of diachronic changes. Mm, I think the peak was the when the Ministry of Health shared the information of the other countries, except uh, other countries' cases. So after that point, like nobody spoke about the translation at all. So so maybe there was a lot of groundwork because the, to me the the um the member selection which excludes the translators or even Japanese educators who were totally excluded. That was that was just hazardous, you know, for me. So, 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 um, I think not me, not only me, but the, some researchers, but also the uh, discussants within the panel, uh, also made a comment like that. You know, we were uh, we were sort of following the you know um, already decided um, panel project uh, panel um, trajectory. So, um, so it's, it seems to me and to others, uh, the, the, the already the, the goals were also preset even before uh, the panels uh, began. So I think maybe the catastroph catastrophize is, is a really strong verb. So maybe, <laughs> but maybe I did too much, but I think to me, it's almost like uh, that, that the impact and was, was like, what was, was uh, pretty much felt. I would say that catastrophize is like exactly right. Because oh, okay. <laughs> that's exactly the, the energy that it gives off. You're like, whoa, okay. Maybe I think there's, there's just too much information. So I think the audience might have difficult time processing in the <laughs> early in the morning. So yeah. I apologize. <laughs> I think there was one question. Oh, yes, there's one question. There was two questions. Let's see. Since you can see them as well, you can 
feel free to choose. So the questions were uh, written written in Japanese, but should I answer them in in English, right? Yes. So that, okay. So the for the first question, uh, whether the the lowering the Japanese level of the national licensure examination is 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 leading to the lowered level of the national licensure examination. So I think I think that the, the panel didn't uh, talk, uh, didn't discuss um, anything about the lowering the level of Japanese language education because they were, um, of course, today I only talk about the translated national examination and, and, and also uh, with the uh, the the Japanese communication ability test, but also the other panels discussed the the potential use of plain language instead of the uh, professional um, you know lang languages or professional words. So I think it's it's really difficult to say whether that that is considered as the low in the Japanese language level. And so, but for the uh, exam advisory panel discussions so they see that the the changing something changing about anything about language is lowering the Japanese language uh lowering the standard of, of the national licensure examination so but I think uh, a lot of researchers have been uh, taking a really cautious stance that you know there were other ways to maintain the level of uh the national licensure examination and then to make the examinations uh, language expression more uh, more uh, readable and and also um, and I don't know uh, structures uh, in a more <laughs> in a plain way because of there's, there's a just too many comp for example there's too many compounds in one sentences and and even the Japanese uh, na native or native uh, Japanese test taker are, are having a tough time so. I think um, I think that's exactly how the the discussants conceive these two equation. But uh, a lot of Japanese language educators and and also healthcare researchers are, are disagree uh, with uh, with this kind of equation. So hope this answers your question. Then the second question. Mm, so the question was whether um, whether uh, did the exam reform reflect the input from the people who received a care, such as elder, elderly carers, elder, elderly uh, older citizens, and also their families and patients. I don't think they um, were not reflect but perhaps some of the public uh some of the comments from the public uh comments were uh were from those uh people who received care so in that way they could be reflected but i would say that the, in the panel meeting the public comments were all, all, almost sort of untouched at all so um of course uh, the number is really small so and 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 as I said, the structural issues really uh, um, made made the the discussions to use those extra input uh, to sort of to make the food sort of food for uh, language discussion at all. Uh, and the last and the third question: Have you had the opportunity to look similar in the healthcare sector by other non? Uh, okay. I, I, so I, I, I noticed, I acknowledge one a PhD study done in, in the context of Germany, which uh, recruited Filipino nurses. Uh, to Germany, uh, but that was a pilot scheme, so it's not the not the kind of officialized or formal language policy like the EPA. So the many, I think that there's a lot of you. I think European countries adopt uh, many sort of pilot programs, 
uh, but they were not done in the form of the trade uh, language policy, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, trade policy. So in that way, the, the Jap Japan's EPA program is quite unique. Uh, but Germany, no Anglophone countries. Uh, France and Germany. I, th I don't know anything about France. But Germany, I, I'm pretty sure, I think I, I forgot her name, but I I, 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 I know that the work was done in a context of Germany. Hope this answers your questions. I actually had another question, if that's all right. It's more of a um, kind of a field related question than specifically related to the exam reform, however. Um, but I was just kind of wondering at the very beginning of your presentation, what motivated the, 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 the waves in language policy and planning um, research? Because I know at least with like uh, research on language and gender, a lot of that was motivated by changes in gender studies in general that kind of eventually washed over to like linguistic research. And I was wondering what kind of broader changes affected language policy and planning research. Mm, that's a really difficult question to answer, but I think a lot of so social, uh, sort of social research have taken a ethnographic turn these days. Um, so I think that would impact a lot on social linguists, uh, social linguistics in, in general. Mm -hmm. So maybe less on apply, apply linguistic, I'm not sure. But so somehow the social linguistics uh, has, uh, some, some social linguists have been uh, trained together with the anthropologist. Mm -hmm. So maybe anthropology, especially linguistic anthropology, have a lot of uh, impact on the way the 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 social linguistic has been operating and has been moving towards uh, at the moment. So maybe the linguistic uh, anthropology may have an stamp for the the LPP. I guess mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that would make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, one question. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Uh for the question just posed, I, I'm not sure uh what exactly that the the person meant by kaeru hitsyo ga identity. So if possible, you can uh, continue to uh, to write in the uh, Q&A box. But for in the mean, for the time being, so um, I think in, I think I perhaps in the last slide, I said the the um, the sort of other competing discourse that Japan is, you know, lagging behind the other countries because, you know, other countries are also, you know, um, rushing into finding the following healthcare workers of so Japan has to compete with those countries. So these kind of discourse was not um, uh, was was not was there in the policy text, but it was not taken up as a major um, this uh, major uh, sort of uh, evidence or major discourse amongst the um, the meeting uh, advisory meeting. So I, I think, as I said, I think a lot of um, uh, discussions in a meeting have referred to the Japan's reputation, Japan's healthcare standards. So that's all about. So, um, so, um, so that's what I meant. So, if if the, that's kind of you know, uh, Japan is losing other country discourse is gets more represented in a wider um, I don't know social political discourse and public discourse. Maybe the exam reform could be reinitiated, but I think it, it is uh, it's a, it's a long shot, I guess. Mm. 
So the, the, the clarification question for LPP, language policy and planning. So LPP stands for language policy and planning. So LPP, policy and planning. All right, we have unfortunately reached the end of our time today. Um, so I would like to close today's event and once again, thank Dr. Otomo for insightful lecture and thank the audience for joining us this morning. Uh, you can find the latest information on Tokyo College through our website, mail magazine, and social media. So please stay tuned and keep an eye out for future events. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Dr. Otomo. Thank you very much.